Hello everyone, I'm Adi Oladupa and welcome once again to the men's room where we discuss everything men. Today, we're going to discuss anxiety. Um, I'm joined as always by my sidekick, Mr. <laughs> Rory Jennings. How are you, Rory? Good? Yeah, I was better until I was referred to as a sidekick. It but works, yeah, I'm, it just I'm works, okay. doesn't it now? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a sidekick okay. on your YouTube channel. You're a sidekick to me on the men's okay, room podcast. It's a power play. It's a power play. So you see, you're going to last longer. Okay. Once you sit in the green chair, you've got all the power, <laughs> as you know. We're also joined by psychotherapist, author and podcaster, Joshua Fletcher. Josh, how are you, man? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me on. This is an interesting topic because I think it's going to go to so many different spaces and, uh, and places. Uh, anxiety. Describe it. What does it mean? Uh, I mean, it's, it's a word that covers a lot really um one person's anxiety is uh, not the same as someone else's uh, a really helpful distinction that i like to make is you split anxiety into two mm. you've got your conventional anxiety which is i'm worried about my job interview an exam a first date a medical test whatever every anxiety that everyone can relate to yeah but then you've got the other side of anxiety that needs more attention to uh, being brought to it a bit like mm. what we're doing today. And this is the inwards kind of disordered anxiety stuff. So mm. this is when we have panic attacks, struggle with intrusive thoughts, uh, when we avoid doing stuff, when we constantly ruminate, uh, our days are dictated by what if thoughts, I should thoughts, um, and we have strange symptoms, heart palpitations, dissociation, really, really sticky anxiety. So when one person says, you know, oh, uh, you know, I'm struggling with anxiety for me as a therapist and as someone who's been there as well. I was diagnosed with severe anxiety years ago. Uh, I w I'd want to know, well, what kind of anxiety are you struggling with? And uh, I'll talk about that today. If, it's good if that you he split it in two, isn't it? Because I think the first one we all go through. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like whether or not we even before we go on air, bit nervous because mm. you're going to go on air. So you, you feel like that level of anxiety just in life in general. And that can be good. That yeah, kind yeah. of that kind of anxiety, I think, can be beneficial mm. because certainly when I was sitting my exams, it was the fear of not doing well in them that inspired me to try and do well in them. It's mm. the fear of it going wrong that kind of inspired me to try and make it go right. Yeah. So it can be quite focusing. That kind of anxiety, as you mentioned there, nervous of a date, nervous of an exam. For me, I just define that as life. That's just part of the process of living. Yeah, you're nervous about particular events, but that's part of the rich tapestry of life. Mm -hmm. The other side of anxiety that you touched on there, well, that's that that's terrifying. That's very different, I think. And mm -hmm. I would, I would probably be wrong here, Josh. And I'm very happy to be, and used to being, in fact. But <laughs> <laughs> but you know the first kind that you referred to, going on a date. Is that not just life? That isn't anxiety. That is just that is just your everyday life. Uh, absolutely, um, and yeah, you're right. It, it can be a positive emotion, and um, it's been proven to be a performance enhancing um, part of part of your body, mind and body. Um, if you're, you know, the world athletics are on at the moment. If if you're about to do the hundred meters, you want to be anxious because you've got more adrenaline, more cortisol. You're going to be, you know, you, your muscles are going to use that. It's it's performance enhancing. It's uh, to an extent as well uh, psychologically. Um, when I I remember doing my exams and caring a lot, so I, so I would read the question twice because I'm a yeah. bit anxious. I'd read over my answers. I'm not just sat there half asleep, you know, trying to get through it. It, it can be helpful. Where it becomes difficult. And I use the word disorder because I like its literal meaning. Not, I'm not just trying to mm. diagnose everyone. <laughs> um, but um, disorders is in, not in the right place. So you know you're struggling with anxiety when you're sat in a place where you're having that threat response. Because that's what it is, a threat response. Mm. I'm afraid of threat. You're having that threat response in a place that there is no threat. There's no threat there. And then you start to worry, well, why am I so anxious all of a sudden? Then, this is where it can get really sticky, uh, your imaginative brain, your thought brain, uh, wants to try and help you. And that's when anxiety can get really, really fruity. Because then it's, you start getting images and imaginations, you start playing out worst case scenarios. Uh, I've, I've, heard about, I've heard about this. There's some, is it called catastrophizing? Yeah. It's mm -hmm. called catastrophizing, isn't it? Where something small happens and then your brain goes, 
okay, well, this is what could happen. If everything went as wrong as it possibly could, this is what what could happen. And you end up trying to process that, which is effectively an imaginary, an imaginary catastrophe that is almost definitely not going to happen. But that is what you were trying to process. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And um, you, you, you must remember anxiety is literally your threat response. And it has never, ever evolved from our ancestors when they were uh, mooching about through the jungle, Serengeti, wherever. They're, that part of the brain which is part of our limbic system, um, I just call it the threat response for mm. sim simplistic purposes, is um, yeah, it's never evolved. It's the fastest, but also the kind of stupidest part of our brain as well. And it's there just in case we're in danger. And you're at 99.9% .9 of the time we're not in danger, mm. but just in case. That's why you jump when your friend jumps out, you know, yeah, and yeah, makes yeah. it there's a part of you that's like, just in case, you know. Have you ever uh, nodded off? You must have had this where you've, tried to nod off to sleep and then you've dreamt that you've like tripped over a curb or something mm. just in case yeah fall off you. a building right? yeah. <laughs> quite regularly and i wake up as if i've fallen and i kind of go am i no i'm okay well that's your threat yeah. response just in case you're falling yeah, off a yeah, building yeah, you're like yeah. well i'm not i'm in my bed um and it depending on what the threat is mm. is where people struggle with their anxiety so if you struggle with social anxiety and you're shy other people's judgments threat. If you struggle with panic attacks, then panic itself is the threat. If you struggle with catastrophizing, mm. then any situation could be the threat. And what again, what I do as a therapist and an anxiety expert is I like to break down where is your anxiety giving you trouble and how does it apply to you? Why does it consume so many people? Like, like you mentioned athletics there, for example, the world championships are on right now. And there used to be a guy that used to run called Asa for Pal. Like, you probably know of him. Um, unbelievable. When there wasn't much on the line, this guy would beat everyone. Like run almost world record times all the time. Every time I got to the Olympics or world championships, it would just, you could see it. You could see him at the start line, almost just having almost a mini panic attack. And he would never ever do his best. And ultimately his career has been defined by him not being able to produce on the big stages. And I feel like that anxiety, which everyone obviously has in that start line, but obviously they use it to their positive. He uses it as a negative and it just completely ruins him. He's the Harry Kane of athletics. Oh, <laughs> never delivers in the big ones. Exactly. Never delivers. <laughs> Wait, why, why are some people like that? Uh, you'd have to, I mean, I can only speculate here. Um, and obviously, if, if we're speculating, the Safa Power might, on the big stage, when it matters the most, yeah. He might have more anxiety, more. I mean, probably the pressure mm. that's on him is, is added, and that kind of you see that in all sports. Um, I'd love to ask mm. him, you know, what was going through his mind there. Um, taking, uh, I've worked with kind of many um, sports professionals, and each person has their own kind of um, reasoning. But a common one I hear is actually when people make their entire self-esteem their entire value on that that moment that moment this count is counterproductive you know asafa powell is, is is a human being he's mm. probably got loads of strings to his bow mm. but I'm, i can't imagine the whole athletics world telling them this telling him that what's going on also you've got to remember the kind of genetics plays plays a part as well the stuff that it's not in our control you know if you've got an anxious mom or or, or dad or you've noticed that anxiety's gone through the family, you're gonna inherit those mm. genetics as well. So you, your body might be releasing more anxiety than your, the, the, the guy next to you. So yeah, th there's many factors in there. And it's, it, to be honest, there's someone, you know, I, I find it fascinating. I don't, I'd love the chance to ask him, to be honest. To be mm. like, no, what, it is. I what's think going through your head? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I think it's, it's, it is really interesting because you know, if you keep it in a sporting context, mm. which I certainly like to do because I find it very relatable, Didier Drogba constantly turning up when it really mattered. That's more than that's more than luck, isn't it? That's more than yeah, the right place at the right time. Sporting ability. That is a mental. That yeah. is that is something that separates him mentally yeah. from his counterparts. Yeah. Didier Drogba. It, you know, if you score in one final call, if you score in two, decent. Three, you're a pretty good player. Eleven. Yeah, what, there could be. Doing? There must be tests that can yeah. be done to show that when he goes, when he has these stress levels, he seems to just. 
like he plat he's normal. Mm. His heart rate doesn't or, go up. Or, or it does normal. massively, but he uses it the correct way. Mm. I think I think you know the occasion when you walk out and the Champions League music's playing and you're playing against Munich in Munich, it's massive. Maybe he could use that and use it as a positive. And maybe all of those, you know, those sportsmen that really do reach the zenith of their game. Mm. And, you know, the people that are icons forever, Michael Jordan, Cristiano Ronaldo, Lionel Messi. Maybe, maybe that is part of it. Having the ability to use those pressured situations when not only is, not only is it up to you to try and win, but people kind of expect it of you. Your teammates are looking for you. It's not only your fans. The other fellas on the pitch who share the responsibility, they're looking at you. Mm. To be able to use that as a positive is a very particular skill. And I, I honestly think it's mental. It can't be. Yeah, because they've all all of them on that pitch have are skills. world-class have players. Have skills, yeah. exactly. So it must be something mental that separates them. Exactly. And you're right, they use the anxiety in a good way and it doesn't, they don't let it consume them. I remember when I had my own sort of issues of anxiety where I used to think the world's going to come to an end. Like, oh, th th that's it. Like the smallest thing that you guys have just mentioned, I used to think I'd blow that up into the biggest thing. And I remember <laughs> the only way I could get through it was to, it was my own sort of, the only way I could, is by thinking, okay, this is not death or jail. I know it sounds extreme, but like, I'm not going to die and I'm not going to jail. And that's the only way I'd get through whatever I was making into the biggest thing in the world. Mm. And that was my own way of getting through it, thinking, okay, you, you, no one's killing you and you're not going to go to jail. So... And I used to think, what's the worst thing that could happen? And those were the two biggest things. But that's probably quite things. good, isn't it? Like, in terms of coming up with a solution to your own problem, whatever you've got, is this, would this be good advice? Whatever you've got to say mm. to keep moving forward. Yeah, these are the, what's the worst thing that can happen? Yeah. And for me, the worst two things were, I'm going to go jail or die. Okay, it's not those two then. Yes. Right, it's just, well, it's survivable then. <laughs> yeah, we're yeah, we're yeah, right yeah, then, yeah. aren't we? You know, yeah. We're going to get through it. That, that's the, my own way of doing well, it. Well, that's a coping strategy yeah. and, and it's okay. I mean, uh, I'm a Newcastle fan and I've watched them since I was younger. And, yeah, you know, it's when, when, it's when, not going to help <laughs> the anxiety. Yeah. Though, yeah. I, re I remember being at the, I was at the, the Etihad because my partner is a huge City fan and we were sat behind the goal and watching Aguero score his fifth. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, well, at least, at least my teeth aren't being removed. So, yeah. <laughs> so you could use that as a coping yeah. strategy. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Start, start Googling how Sunderland are getting on. <laughs> yeah. well, at least they're losing, yeah. 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 <laughs> uh, but um, it, it depends what it is, because like in some situations, well, the worst case scenario here is that I could die. Well, I don't want to die. So, yeah. so, mm. so I don't, you know, it depends. Uh, for me, I always teach um, the philosophy of leaning into uncertainty. The uncertainty is the skill, and this could actually relate to what we were talking about before. Is like how good at you are tolerating that uncertainty that is hovering over you. Maybe mm. you did your drug per. It's mm. like I'm all right with the uncertainty with being there. Whereas a Safa Powell might be like, you know, the, the, this mass amounts of uncertainty is actually affecting my performance. Um, the, all anxiety and particularly disordered anxiety, what we're talking about, is about our relationship with uncertainty. Um, I was someone who, who was diagnosed with OCD, uh, an actual diagnosis. OCD is not an adjective, you know, to describe cleanliness or whatever. It's mm -hmm. a crippling anxiety disorder for many. And I just wanted certainty that all those horrible thoughts, mm -hmm. like you, know, you could uh, relate to Addie's. Uh, you know, is the world going to end? You know, mm. I, I needed certainty that it wouldn't happen. I needed certainty that I wouldn't, you know, freak out in public or I wouldn't get bullied at school or I needed certainty that Aguero wouldn't do that to me again. And then he did. Did you, um, <laughs> you know, when you just said there that you, you, public going, you know, having, having a sort of public issue, did anything ever happen like that? You know, when you were at your when you were struggling at the lowest point, did anything ever happen? And if it did, how did people react? Like, do you think there is a stigma still there? Yeah, I mean, I, I, st I was struggled. Re the reason I became a therapist was um, I had a panic attack um, at work. And if you, I'd never known what a panic attack was. I'd never really used the word anxiety before. I just thought it meant, you know, mm. worried about exams. Um, and at the time, you know, I was, uh, I was working in a school with excluded kids um, in Bolton. And there was lots of stuff happening at home as well as looking after my brother who was very poorly. And 
my stress was just going up and up and up and up and I was ignoring it, ignoring it, not doing the right things, um, smoking cannabis to self-medicate, maybe having a few beers or whatnot, and which is, you know, each to their own, but in the situation I was in, it perhaps wasn't great. Uh, and then one day I just woke up feeling like quite hyper and I was like, I never wake up feeling awake. I yeah, like, yeah. I'm like, that's odd. And I must have had three hours sleep. Uh, I got the bus to work, started making a cup of tea. And as I was stirring the, the, the tea bag, um, I just felt suddenly like, whoa, I don't feel like I'm here. I felt like I was in the matrix. Um, I felt like, you ever seen Men in Black? Where yeah. they, where yeah. they, that scene where they open yeah. up that guy's head yeah. and there's a little alien inside mm. it. That's what it felt like. I could feel myself, hear myself talking. People look like clay. I was like, I've done it. I've lost my mind. I've finally done it. You know. Uh, um, but what was actually happening is I was having a panic attack, where my threat response had decided to use a month's worth of chemicals and just go bam. And I was like, whoa, what's going on here? Uh, it was describing it like a high that I didn't do. There was no explanation mm -hmm. for it, and I was terrified. Um, and I actually got my mum to pick me up. I went home and I tried to work it out. I had these strange symptoms. My hands didn't look like mine. I was hyperventilating, sweating. I was like, what have I done here? I was trying to work out what was going on. And I was in my room, didn't leave my house for about three months. I was really quite poorly. And then I f what really helped was just someone explaining to me what on earth was going on. I was like, you I can't be a panic room. attack. You didn't leave your room for three months? I, I couldn't even, I would be terrified to go and use the, 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 the toilet. And bear in mind, I was a, a confident person before it as well. I do stand-up comedy, uh, play music. I did drama. Oh, um, so, yeah, it, was, it really it catch, caught me off guard. Didn't catch anyone off guard. Um, and then I learned about it and, and through certain things. Uh, my, my doctor didn't actually help. The, my medication just made me feel more anxious because I was just constantly wondering when the medication was going to work or whatever and anyway, i learned a lot about it uh psychoeducation what's happening in my brain, my mind my body what's going on and i realized actually i'm quite normal this is okay this is something that happens around this time and i was so passionate about it i started writing my books about it and doing what i do when you say around yeah. this time what do you mean like you can sense triggers what do you so the stats tell you that like panic attacks like that, um, and anxiety disorders mostly happen between the ages of 16 and young 30s. Mm. Uh, and I was like 22, mm. 23 at the time. Um, this wasn't explained to me though. I was saying the, the information wasn't there for me at the time and that's why I love doing things like this because you know, if someone's listening, watching now and you're like, whoa, that, that describes me. It's like, <laughs> you know, yeah, it's, yeah. you're going to be sweet. Mate. Yeah, you're, you're all right. Yeah. You know, I know it feels like there's a gun to your head and whatever. But you're all right. It's, it's strange to get your head around that you're not actually in danger. You just feel like you're in danger. Gosh, that's yeah. terrifying. Well, work supportive. I was lucky to have supportive work, but I've heard many stories of work not being supportive. Now, <laughs> yeah. really? I, I was lucky. I was very lucky. I, I just wonder if people are listening to this and they're almost trying to self-diagnose how they separate sort of being in sort of anxiety one that we mentioned, mm. which is your everyday stresses of life mm. and what you went through in two. A lot of people would just assume that it's one and just kind of, you know, we I think we spoke about this last week, just roll your sleeves up. It's only that, it's just part of life. Mm. Yeah. And whether or not, okay, it's got to the point where it's serious. Cause you mentioned as well for yourself where, you know, your stress levels are going up, but you're still just going to work. It was just keep on going, keep on moving. And I just wonder if people are gonna think that, like, okay, no, 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 it's okay, this is it, we're okay, you know, we just gotta keep on going to the point where you just hit a wall, mm. like you hit. Mm. And it's almost, how do people not hit that wall? When do they realize, okay, this is a bit more than just level one? Uh, that's a really good question. Um, the best way to, to do it is to, you know you're struggling with horrible, excessive anxiety when your days are dictated by a feeling of doom, dread, mm. um, loads of what if thoughts. We all have what if thoughts, they're okay, you know, but I mean, when it's just constant, catastrophic what if thoughts, um, you don't feel like yourself, you don't feel like your old you, um, you're turning down things that you wouldn't usually turn down, mm. maybe it's, mm. you know, you're playing golf with your mates or going for drinks or whatever, and you start to withdraw. Um, this can be anxiety as well as depression. It gets often misinterpreted. Anxiety gets misinterpreted as depression quite a lot. Um, 
uh, and you just constantly feel the sense of fear. Um, then you you don't really tell anyone because you know I don't I don't live in a dream world. There's still a massive taboo around it. Um, not that your friends wouldn't care, but also there's a taboo around just having the conversation and sitting in the awkward silence of your friend not knowing what to what to say. Uh, it's not their fault. It's just mm. the fabric yeah. of communication hasn't been woven yet. Um, yeah, it's that's when you're in too disordered anxiety there. Um, and you might be, your diet will go, your sleep's rubbish, you're having strange symptoms, palpitations, you're obsessed with how you feel. That's one of the big ones. I was obsessed with how I felt. I went from not really caring how I felt to all my attention inwards. And what do you mean emotion. emotionally, not physically? Both. Right. Yeah. Or is the anxiety there yet? Um, is my heart beating normally? Stuff like that. And right. I, I, I was never really having any attention on the self to having suddenly all the attention on the self mm. yeah oh yeah even sometimes do i feel sad does that mean i'm going to get depressed am i going to lose control it's just constant rumination mm. uh yeah that's when you need to kind of get some help for it yeah i think it's so important to to differentiate as you said there because i mean when you and i have discussed these kind of things in the past i've generally adopted quite a stern approach for example you know keep going pull yourself together that kind of attitude but that would only be applicable to the first kind that we're talking about this yeah. second kind is illness is that fair to say yeah you can illness it's things aren't right things need to be put back in place it's like mm. if you you can apply the attitude of keep going and i don't you know there's a place for that definitely mm. sometimes when i'm like if i'm doing a talk and i'm really anxious i'll psych myself up I'm like come yeah. on you can do this and I'm, get on with it yeah, you know, absolutely. you're brave uh, and that's fine absolutely but um no disorder anxiety you're on a loop and if but if you're only saying come on get on with it pull your sleeves up you're just increasing the 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 speed of that hamster wheel that you're on you're not going anywhere you know and it's, you, yeah. it's funny because in this industry which is still quite new to me it's quite new to you to be fair mm. since we've been doing this I've, I've been a broadcaster for five years and i still have i'm still especially when i get something new like oh Ade, we want you to do this i'm like mm. <laughs> better my comfort zone this one and i definitely get stress levels um, and they go through the roof, like literally go through the roof. I remember talking to my mum about this and I was like, I feel like I shouldn't be as nervous now because I've been doing it five years, but I could be doing anything and I get really, really nervous to the point where my mum, who, bless her, she's very, very um, like Bible orientated, like a Bible basher, definitely. And she gave me a pi Bible passage to read. Like before anything, before any big gig, I've got a Bible passage that I read. And that then brings it down a little bit. Now, honestly, that's that brings that stress level down a bit. But I just wonder if that's if that's almost crossing over slightly to two. Or is that just one still, where it's just part and parcel of nervous? It's just another gig, or am I sort of verging on two, where it's like I, I'm too stressed out about these gigs. I've been doing them for years. I should be okay now. I mean, not to turn into in, 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 into your therapist, but I think no, you, feel free. You, 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 I also know what that Bible passage is, uh, but like, uh, but um, there's a. Uh, you could say you're on one foot in either. It's okay. Um, I mean, the first thing I say to people when they've got anxiety around the job and stuff is that if you're not nervous, you don't care. I mean, yeah, you know, you, you're nervous because you care. Mm. Um, maybe it's a result of you putting a lot of pressure on yourself, perfectionism. Can I do it? Can I pull it off? But also at the same time, you know, it's it, you're using that. It's okay. You've got coping strategies in there. I think it's really lovely that you know you've got a supportive parent. It's like you, yeah. know, you can do that, and you're getting through it every time. You know, if you started to turn down work, if you started to do all yeah. these things, then then you'd be more in in mm. two. But you know, you you I think you know that you're going to do also, it. Also, Addie, it would be wild for you, considering the pressure that is on some of the jobs that you do. Yeah, like you know, hosting hosting a sporting show with a co-host as somebody like. Tony Bellew, who is famous and an idol of yours, you know, you've been a boxing devotee all your life. You've supported and watched Tony Bellew. Suddenly you're on Next a par one. with Tony right. Bellew and you're the broadcaster. You're responsible for that, ultimately, even though he's he's the authority. It's on you. You've got the director in your ear. He's Tony Bellew. He hasn't really got the pressure. It is you carrying the show. It would be wild for you to not feel anxious going into that. It'd be wild for you to not have butterflies. Mm. But that's kind of going back to what I meant before, where they can be inspiring. But I think I think Josh has hit the nail on the head very early in this pod. Butterflies aren't OCD. 
Do you know what I mean? Like what you what you're talking about is certainly in the realm of normality. Whereas whereas as Josh said there, if you started saying, Okay, I'm not gonna do that job, I'm gonna turn down the opportunity, then we would have to have a then there's a serious conversation. conversation. Yeah. Is there more men suffering from anxiety than than women or is it always just always portrayed no, as a man same. thing, isn't it? it? Is, it's yeah, always portrayed no, as a yeah. man it's, thing. It's down the line. It's it's a human condition. Yeah. The only thing that changes is our conditioning as 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 men. I'm so surprised uh, you've said that. I'm, I'm, I'm so surprised well. you've I'm said shocked. that. Oh, absolutely. No, but th- th- think about it. Here's a, here's a word to show off at parties. It's called interjections. It's one of my favourite <laughs> words. I need a few of these. Addy, write it down. Addy, one day, one day you get, me with the big words. Addy, one day you'll get invited sure. to a party. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can use it. This is what This is um. This is what I talk about a lot, particularly with males. No, um, we're more susceptible, and. But any gender is susceptible to anxiety. It's a human thing. Um, with kind of women o- older in life with the hormonal changes like the menopause and things like that, they're, they're perhaps more susceptible to an anxiety disorder later on. But in general, anxiety, disorder anxiety affects everyone. Um, men definitely suppress it more because of something I like to call an introjection. It's we're, an introjection is when we absorb a belief system from growing up mm. and i have done a lot of work on picking mine as a man i like being i like being a man i like certain elements of masculinity there's some elements of masculinity i can't stand and they weren't helpful for me but we are a result of these interjected beliefs so for example uh i always use my, my own um you know like a, 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 my, my grandma's died at the, at the funeral and I'm crying because that's a healthy biological mechanism that our brain has to help us process grief. Something horrendous has happened. Crying's like normal, you know, it should be normalized. And as I'm crying because I'm never going to see um, my, gra- my grandma again, my uncle leans over, authoritative male, puts his hand on my shoulder and says, don't cry, be strong for your grandma. Now, I've interjected a belief that strength equates to holding in my emotions mm. uh, and also I'm not getting the kind of approval from, from males. Uh, and yet he's holding back the tears himself. But for some reason, there's a reverence in the emotional conservatism of not showing your emotions, which is was great in world, in the world wars. Mm. You've not got time for that <laughs> kind, of, kind of thing. You know, like, hunker down, let's, we're about to die. But now, I mean... That emotional conservatism is one of the biggest problems that, it, in my professional opinion, that we have. Um, it's the contributor to why the biggest killer of men under 50 is suicide. Um, because men, that that reverence of putting on a display and showing that you've got everything in order is so strong that it comes at the risk of actually showing that, you know... That, that, that I wonder if that's generational, though. I think that that's a very yeah. poignant and powerful story, but I, I I, think I conform to a lot of the stereotypes that go along with your uncle in this story. Yeah. Like, the stere- I think I conform to those, but not this particular one. So I would and would and will... I mean, I, you know, I hope this doesn't come around for a long time, but when the day comes where my grandmother passes, I will be a wreck and I won't apologize for that and I know that that will be the case and that's definitely how I will process that I don't I feel like perhaps there has been a shift maybe generationally where tears and emotion and open open emotional honesty isn't frowned upon the way it once was I feel like there are lots of other issues but I'd like to think that we've moved on a little bit from that big boys don't cry I think is outdated, or at least is becoming outdated. Uh, it's starting to shift, but we, I would say it's it's nowhere near. Like really? It's, yeah, I see it in my own friendship groups. Uh, I've got, I'm one of the leading therapists for anxiety disorders, and my own mates that I grew up with, they wouldn't open up to me. Right. Yeah. It's, it's, I, it, the power dynamic, I'm a threat. It, because mm. of who I am, it's it's interesting. My, my f- female friends, very happy to open up. Mm. The, the men know because it is and I don't care what we have internalized prejudices that it is weakness and we can have the platitudes in that but I, if I were to really ask most guys say would you stand in front of your mates and start crying deep down they'd be like no they'd do it performatively so if it was for say I don't know 
something like this or whatever I think they would. But deep down with your mates, no one watching, no, I agree. you wouldn't do I it. I think that's why the, the Paddy Pimblet mm. sort of um, clip has gone so far because it doesn't happen. If that was an everyday occurrence... And he's a fighter. Yeah, and he's a fighter. And he's a right? fighter. So he's like as, mm. as he's double hard. He's just he's just walloped someone in a rig. Like someone, <laughs> yeah, yeah. and all of a sudden he's showing emotion. It's like, and then, yeah, uh, because that. that doesn't happen, I think that's why that clip's gone so crazy. Yeah, absolutely. similar to when Tyson Fury sort of spoke about mental health and stress, because we don't see that. That's why it's so. I think if you see it every day, then it wouldn't. Well, you're starting to see it in sports now a lot. Loads I mean, more. it was Simona Halep, one of the, yeah, the best tennis, tennis players. players. Mm. She had a panic attack on court, mm. and she's used, you know steely mm. professional like a machine of a tennis player and yeah you see it a lot um steven reed yeah, yeah. played for blackburn yeah. didn't he the island, island, Forest island yeah. yeah he's he's um he's come out and he struggled a lot with anxiety things like that mm. tyra mings recently said mm. something mm. i think it, i think it is but you see that that kind of pressure particularly elite level sports people i do i do get it i do understand like the pressures because if nothing else, it's 25,000 people every week on Tyrone Ming's case. Do you know what I mean? Like, if nothing else, it's it's the home support of which is more than 25,000. That's weird. Michael Johnson was talking about this recently uh, at the World Athletics Championship. The former Man City player. <laughs> no, the other Forgot one. Forgot about him. <laughs> <laughs> He's an estate agent now, by the way. Yeah. Estate agent. Doing yeah. it right for himself. Yeah. But he was... Dina Asher-Smith, one of the athletes, was, was talking about her struggles that she's gone through in the last sort of three or four months, uh, her grandma dying, who she was very close with. And Michael Johnson said, this is interesting because before, athletes, if you lose, you lose. They're, you know, you're almost not allowed to give an excuse as to why I came fifth or sixth. Mm. Like if you just came fifth, you'd walk away, there'd be no interview. And now he said, it's, it's a new generation that he loves. Of You can tell your backstory, what happened, as to why maybe you're not performing. Because I think we look at these athletes as robots. So when they don't perform, we just laugh. Mm. when we don't really know what's going on and a lot of them are suffering through a lot of stress and anxiety but this is why it's important that going back to the word introjection mm. imagine this scenario like if you introjection start from even before you're born baby showers boy blues you know boy boy is blue girl yeah. is pink like where was that written you know like <laughs> yeah, who decided well, that you yeah. know kind of, I actually quite like the colour pink but, you, yeah, know, yeah. you know when I was walking around at a festival with a pink shirt on the other day like you know it's those kind of things, but what you interject, imagine coming home from school and your mum and dad don't even turn around and say hello to you, or but then your sister walks in and she's got a medal, you know, sporting achievement, and they put it on the fridge, you know. What are you interjecting from that? Well, to be good at sports gives you value, mm. and that you're not as lovable as your sister. Yeah. What about when you're walking around and seeing, like, you're seeing, like, lad culture, don't you? It's just lots of, you know, like, kind of... Geezers. What, geezers, stuff like that. Which is fun. Like, don't get me wrong, I, I like messing around with my mates and stuff, but lots of it is performative. It's learned, it's copied. It's like, maybe that's what it is to be a guy. Mm. Um, and, and things like that. And with sports people, it must be enormous because the pressure that's on you from as a kid, I mean, if you want to be the, one of the best tennis players, you've got to start playing when you're five. Five. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And you've got to be the best yeah. in your area, but, in your yeah. country. In but, your... but... <laughs> So the the Williams sisters are the model here, aren't they? Yeah. You know they were they were cultivated into being. Mm. What a life! What a career! What a like! It's not only bad, is it? It's important to acknowledge that being brilliant and rising to the very top, the way that they have by dedicating their life to something via a pushy father, it's not only bad. It's like, what's the alternative if they're not tennis players? Mm. They've lived an amazing life. Mm. They're mentioned in a in a Snoop song. I, I <laughs> yeah. love that. Yeah, it's not only bad, is it, or is it? Well, it depends if they like that kind of stuff. Like, it's like where's the? If, Got to love being a Wimbledon champ, haven't you? Got to. Possibly, but I'd imagine so. But who was the tennis player that just completely quit at twenty three? Yeah, Martina retired? Hingis, wasn't it? Didn't Martina uh, Hingis quit? It's, I think it was from last year. It was the Wimbledon, the Wimbledon last champion uh, who now plays golf. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Just yeah, like, yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm done now. Yeah, I'm done. done. <laughs> twenty four. Yeah. I'm just. Everyone's like, what? what do you mean? Yeah. 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 yeah she's gone. I've been doing. So I've been doing this for two decades. <laughs> yeah, she's like, yeah, I'm, I'm, <laughs> yeah. I'm out of here. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I love that. I was like, she's like, no, don't know. I find I find it fascinating that she did that and almost like good. Yeah, it's difficult, isn't it? Because on the way here, just seconds ago, I've got a three-year-old daughter and I just dropped her off at nursery and I was really early today. I was in Stratford very early and uh, gave Addy a, a message. The reason I was so early, I just mentioned to him casually, was because I had to drop my daughter at French. 
like so it starts early so i get to the train station a bit earlier and whatever and in our conversation you were like that's brilliant you you were you actually celebrated it. i just said she was at french and mm. you were like mate that's fantastic she's you know whatever yeah that's a Williams father, isn't it? To a degree. It's it's on the process of nurturing and trying to encourage. Mm. I don't always think it's it's bad. I think giving your kids the best opportunity and maybe being pushy can result in a, a legacy and a, and a life that they would have never had. It's not yeah. only bad. No, no, it's certainly not. There will always be some resentment from these superstar athletes that yeah, you're resenting it from your Miami mansion and with your Wimbledon <laughs> trophy you're, you're also looking at it though from that they're the exception to the rule yeah only one person gets to be champion yeah and yeah. the thousands, hundreds and thousands of people who have the same pushy yeah parents yeah are not champion. Yeah. They're not in a Snoop Dogg video. Yeah. yeah. yeah and, and they're going to feel like failures. And I think that's why you get a lot of sports people, particularly at the end of their careers. If you look at um, rugby, mm. particularly. Particularly rugby, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, I, saw, you, I saw some data on that. Of, uh, football. Yeah. Cricket as well. I saw, have you cricket, seen this, yeah. the, the data for cricket? Um, Basically, people when, when fellas finish mm, playing cricket, and I've, I've only seen the fellas data, it may be applicable to the, mm. to the girls as well. But when, when fellas finish playing cricket, the, the drop off in terms of mental health and whatever is huge because I think you go from play cricket in only lovely locations, right? You go from touring the world to being part of a team to suddenly potentially having to learn a trade or whatever. Mm. And a lot of people struggle to cope with that. Mm. There is a there is a there is an issue in cricket. Yeah, and if you're not a champion, you don't have the the legacy to fall back mm. on and stuff. So yeah, if you take that example, it's it's great. You know. You, what does it take to be the best? Yeah, you're right. So it would have to take that. Um, but at the same time, it comes with it at a cost, mm. uh, I, I find. Um, and you do see it. I mean, I, I believe like kind of a chronic anxiety and disordered anxiety comes from, I use the example of a stress jug. It's 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 not original. It's just but it's something I like to use. And it's, you know, we all have the ability to tolerate stress um, in in a jug or a cup. Uh, the size of that cup is dependent on genetics. So my mum and dad are quite anxious, so my cups can be quite small. So I've got to be very careful what stress goes in there. Mm. If you think about stress that goes in there, you've got like money, relationships, career, um, pandemics, um, things like that, and it starts to go up, go up, go up, and then throw in a bit of grief in there, a bit of, a bit of traumatic events, a mm. uh, bit of whatever, and suddenly overflows. And at that moment it overflows, it's the moment you start experiencing panic attacks. Um, how do you, I'm gonna cut across you, how do you stop it you don't. from overflowing? Oh, like, overflowing. What, how, do, how do you? Preventative, brilliant, this is what I tried. Uh, you, first of all, you've got to identify what's in there. Like I, I've sat with guys in my therapy room and it's taken ages for them to actually have a look in because they just put the lid on. They're like, I'm not bothered, I'm a guy, I can handle it, I'm hard. You know, it's like, all right, well, good luck with that one, mate. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 I'm a mate who's, and I'll, I'll be very candid here. I've, I've had a mate who, who I grew up with, uh, and and he has that kind of mindset, and, and he is quite hard actually. But anyway, <laughs> yeah. uh, but, but he's, um, but he lost his dad, mm. and naturally, I was like, you know, you, you want to talk about? It? I lost my dad, man. It was heartbreaking. He was like, mm. I'm all right. And then he suddenly goes into boxing to as an outlook, which is fair enough, mm. whatever. And then he goes into heavy drinking, mm. abusing drugs. And all. I was like, you could just talk about this, you know, you know, mm. uh, you know. Uh, and it took him. The biggest thing was lifting up what was in there, and he actually, had, event, you know, ended up going to therapy and stuff like that. But not only did he find that the grief of his father was in there, there's loads of other stuff that was in there. He's just buried. He's absolutely buried. Some, that's why some people can handle grief better than others because for some people, grief is what makes the, the jug overflow. Mm. And for some people, they've got more resources in there. Mm. You know, whereas, uh, and for me, it was grief that made my jug overflow. There was already stuff going on in, in, in my head. So yeah, it's about looking what's in there because don't expect to turn up to the therapy room with all the answers. When you say it's okay to talk, it's okay to explore. What's going on it's there? It's funny. Like I, I remember when huh. no job, no money. Like, we've all had, we've obviously been through, all been through this, where like there is no money. So I remember the letters coming through the door, and <coughs> I knew what those letters were. I knew it was either bailiff, bills, and I'm thinking, 
I have no money mm. and my stress levels are crazy. I can't open that because I'm not going to open it. It's not going to be a birthday card, Just leave, card, the, door, leave, leave <laughs> the door closed. Honestly, dude, yeah. literally. So yeah. I, and, yeah, I'm going to order a pizza instead. I just knew, <laughs> I, knew, I, knew, I couldn't, couldn't afford the pizza. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but I knew exactly what the bailiff letter looked like. You know, it's yeah, one yeah, of the, yeah. I knew. And it got to a point where I did do what you said yeah. and I just opened them. Like, I remember Saturn, like, it was a big thing for me. Like, all right, we've just got, what can we do? We can't hide through the curtain every time you hear someone approach your door thinking it's a bailiff. So I just opened them. And eventually, you know, I started calling the bailiffs, started to get arrangements, started to, you know, set up direct debits, even if it was a minimum amount. And it was very... I love that analogy. Yeah. <laughs> that's the perfect yeah, that analogy. Was the way, that was honestly yeah. the way. I, mean, I just remember the letters coming. Yeah, and processing, I a problem, processing a problem yeah. is, is the road to sort of solving road, the problem, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. A bit at a time as well. You don't let people think that when you go to therapy or, or when you're going through f- financial mm. issues, you know, you just want it later at a time. Yeah. 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 Like, yeah, like yeah. One bit at a time. So I do in therapy, not like you don't have to unleash everything. No. Um, when people go to, to therapy about anxiety or disordered anxiety, conventional anxiety, just general worries. That's okay. Depression, whatever. You don't need to just splurge it all out. Mm. Be like, w- w- you don't have to talk about any of it. Mm. Just mm. get to get to know me, feel comfortable, and then and then we'll talk about it. Yeah. But yeah, one at a time. Uh, I really like that analogy. Yeah, <laughs> okay. the, We've actually yeah. got a listener question here, Josh. If you wouldn't mind just hearing it and letting us know what you think, <coughs> it says, "My anxiety is most difficult to manage at night. I lay in bed and the silence is hard to deal with. My mind runs away with me, and I never get a good night's sleep. What should I do?" So this is a rumination problem. Uh, this is life changing for me. I was the same. I was be afraid to go to bed because the association with bed is lying there feeling anxious. Uh, rumination is when our attention goes inwards. I call it the rumination roller coaster. What if this happens? Or I'll play it out in my head. And what if that happens? And then I'll try and problem solve that thing happening, even though it probably won't happen. Yeah. Uh, and going round and round and round. Rumination is actually a behaviour. It's not just you thinking. It's a behaviour. You are behaving. You are ruminating. Someone uh, with OCD, um, I've got to watch out for rumination because that's one of my biggest compulsions. Um, Just like someone with OCD may wash their hands or excessively tidy, my compulsion is to sit and just ruminate. And you can tell because I'm sat in a room and I'm just there. Mm. It's all going on in your head. It's all going on in my head, yet ruminate, and that's what's happening. What you can do and your advice for you there is that and I'll probably get this, people who ruminate in bed often keep themselves distracted in the day. You've probably got to-do lists this big, you don't sit by yourself. My advice to you is obviously, you know, CBT therapy is great for things like that and go to therapists or whatever, but if if that isn't for you, practice allowing yourself to, to have, sit with rumination throughout the day but detaching from it. So, because you can't stop your mind, you can't stop thoughts. That's mm. the you know number one rule in psychology. You can't stop thoughts, but you can choose to observe them and focus on other things. Um, I, when I was str- struggling with OCD, but then recovering, I was like, oh, I'm noticed I'm ruminating now. I'm noticing the what ifs. What would I usually be doing right now? Um, I don't know, I was crack on the PlayStation and lose to the easiest level <laughs> on FIFA, I don't know. Um, at bed, obviously, it's difficult because you want to be sleeping. So practice in the day of of sitting with that rumination because you're probably avoiding it all day and then you lie in bed and it's hitting you like a train and then it's releasing adrenaline and cortisol. Um, also, just make it easier. I love listening to stuff like um, audiobooks in bed and podcasts mm-hmm. and things like that because your attention is away from the rumination. It's not distracting. You're not suppressing. In the day, practice with the rumination maybe get therapy and then just change up your routine at night and keep your attention external. You'll, you'll drop off. That must be one, isn't it? That last one, changing your routines up. That must be a big, even if it's going for a walk late at night. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Just habits. Just something different. Yeah. Yeah. We're all, we're, we're, we're creatures of habit. Like mm. Everything's a habit. Uh, I say that to, to my clients. I mean, think about all your automatic habits. I shower the same way. I brush my teeth the same way. I drive the same way. I'm like on autopilot, completely mm-hmm. on autopilot. I make tea the same way. Um, it's so many things on autopilot, which is good. Yeah. But then sometimes some sneaky habits getting in there that they're not helpful. Just before we end, Josh, <clears throat> I want to quickly go back, if we can, to the panic attacks. Because for anyone watching or listening that might be close to that, because there will be some people that... You, 
don't know it's coming and almost feel like it might be coming. Are there any sort of obvious sort of triggers that, okay, maybe you are about to have a panic attack? Is it just something that, for want of a better phrase, you just have to have? It's just going to happen. It's going to, don't fight it because yeah. it cannot hurt you. It feels like it is. Um, if you're having specific panic attacks in relation to certain triggers, mm. that's, that can actually be a sign of trauma and PTSD. So if you have a panic attack when you see a certain person or, or someone who looks like a certain person, if you're having panic attacks because of stuff that, you know, that reminds you of some bad things that happened in your childhood, uh, maybe it could be certain smells, sounds, whatever. For me, it was like um, it was a song when I was growing up and I heard a song and I would just go into a panic attack because of some traumatic events. Then definitely you de you need help with PTSD. You cannot do that on your own. Mm -hmm. um, there's no shame in that. And PTSD isn't just you know returning from the trenches. It's a very uh, common thing. Uh, but the vast majority of panic attacks are not that. If you can feel a panic attack coming along, you just got to ride it out. You can't stop it. Don't resist it. It will last probably five minutes, maybe ten minutes. Uh, most people can't see it. It's not like on Netflix, you know, where they're rolling around on the floor, dissociating. Yeah. That's not most panic attacks. Doesn't they don't occur like that? You can have a panic. I've had panic attacks, full on panic attacks in a room with full of people, and no one's noticed. So inwardly, what really? The vast majority. I of thought panic it was all brown paper bags. And nope, that? that's a myth. It's um, and and that doesn't really work either. But uh, it's a myth. That's malicious, isn't it? That's what that would have yeah. been the first. If someone told me they were having a panic attack, I'd Get go scrambling for a brown paper bag. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the the ambulance stuff used to do that up until like what five six years ago, and I was, and, and realised no, you, you don't need to do anything. It's not hurting you, so why are you mm -hmm. reacting to it? As soon as you react to it, you're teaching the brain that the panic attack itself is dangerous. So the next time you're going to go out and you're like, oh, I hope I don't have a panic attack when I do my podcast. I hope I don't have a panic attack mm -hmm. at the gig. I hope I don't have a panic attack. At... No, just play it. I recovered when I said, I don't really care if I have one. I'd rather not. Yeah. It's not nice, mm -hmm. but I don't care if I have one. And, and I practiced just panicking and realized it's just an adrenaline rush. That's all mm -hmm. it is. A panic attack is just a confusion around why you're having so much adrenaline. So yeah, just let it on. This is just an adrenaline rush. This Josh, has been amazing. It has been. This has genuinely been, this is possibly, if not definitely, my favourite episode. I found it education. I found it interesting. I think you've been so articulate and honest. I've really enjoyed this one. Thank you so much, mate. Oh, thank you very much. Josh, just before you go, how can people get in touch? So uh, I'm Anxiety Josh on social media. That's where I do most of my stuff. Uh, my page is on Instagram. I use quite a lot. Um, yeah, just type in Anxiety Josh, Joshua Fletcher. Uh, uh, my, my face pops up and you can mm. have a look. There's loads of resources there. Loads of free resources as well. Um, and if, you know, if you're a bit like that, that sounds a bit more about what I'm about, you know, go listen to that. It's cool. Josh, really appreciate it. It's been a good one, right? Anxiety. Hopefully we have educated, I say we, Josh has educated you a bit on anxiety. Uh, it's been a really good Men's Room podcast, this one. Make sure you download all the podcasts from wherever you get your podcasts from. And as always say this, if you prefer to watch this, as I always do with my podcast, make sure you head over to Talk Sports YouTube channel where you can watch the podcast as well. From myself, from Rory, from Josh, thank you very much. 